faithful in your giving. And uh, just a couple things I want to mention today. Uh, let's continue to pray for uh, Sean Tolan and his family at the passing of his mother. Our sympathies to you. Um, and then also I want to welcome Logan Ellsbury. Oh, he's on a short break. <laughs> Military man. Got a break. Glad to have you here, my friend. Good to see you. All right. This is the first Sunday of the month. So there's no kids' church today. We're all going to hang here together. Would that be all right with you? Okay. I know some of the kids hate me right now, but I'm still your friend. Okay. <laughs> um, and we're going to have a good time tomorrow night with the fireworks. They've got some uh, glow-in-the-dark activities planned. It's going to be a good old time. And I think we should really uh, – there's jars out there in the foyer. I think Jake needs a pie in the face pretty bad. I'm voting for Jake. <laughs> so put your money in the jar. Uh, it'll be a good fundraiser and a lot of fun. Good time. But we have a great view of the fireworks here. Um, you know, we're a little ways away, but we're straight on. So it's a great view. Uh, and, boy, this weather's been great. So it should be a good time, right? All right. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 13. We've been in a series for a while now talking about the red letters in the Bible. Some Bibles have red letters, and any time there's red letters, that means Jesus is speaking. And God himself says that when Jesus talks, we should listen. And so we've been working our way through John, focusing primarily on the red letters to see what Jesus has to say. Now, last time when we uh, visited together, um, some of the things I pointed out were that uh, God's timing is not our timing. You know, sometimes we're, we're anxious about things, but God has his own timing, and we need to trust his timing. We also talked about how God's perception is not our perception. We see some things in a very negative light, but God sees a bigger picture. And sometimes even the things that we see as a negative, God sees as a positive because he sees that bigger picture. Now today, in verse 7 will be our first point at the red letters. Jesus says, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And so here's the continuation of that thought. God's understanding is above our understanding. He sees and understands things that we don't see and things that we don't understand. He sees the future and the past in perfect 2020 vision. Even beyond that, really. God's understanding is above and beyond our understanding. And so we need to trust Him. He knows what He's doing. How many believe God knows what He's doing? Yes, He does. So let's trust Him. Uh, Corey Tenboom, I just saw this posted on Facebook just the other day, but she said these words When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off, you sit still and trust the engineer. When your life is going through what seems like a tunnel and everything's dark and you don't understand, just sit still and trust the engineer. His understanding is beyond our understanding. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God himself is speaking. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He doesn't just know a little bit more than us. He knows infinitely more than us. His understanding is beyond ours. And here he says, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. One day, when we are standing before the Lord in glory, we will look back at everything that happened in our life and say, wow, you did it just right. Everything was perfect. Even the things that right now we might look at and scratch our heads and think, God surely made a mistake. One day it will all make sense. His understanding is that far beyond our understanding. Then in verse 8, Jesus says, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. We all have dirt in our lives, and God sees it all. There's nothing hidden from him. And Jesus wants to clean us up. And so we need to understand that if you really want to be a follower of Christ, it's going to involve change. 
is he doesn't want you to stay dirty. He wants to clean you up. Kids, uh, the youth had a car wash yesterday. We brought our dirty cars here to get them cleaned up because we didn't want them to stay dirty. And there were some dirty cars. I was just here for a little bit, but I saw one that, oh, my goodness. I think the dirt was holding it together. But it needed cleaned up. Likewise, we need cleaned up. Jesus sees the dirt in our life, and he wants to change us. And if we really want to be a follower of Christ, we're going to have to change. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a song called The Change. And let me read the lyrics to you. It says, well, I got myself a T-shirt that says what I believe. I got letters on my bracelet to serve as my ID. I got the necklace and the keychain and almost everything a good Christian needs. I got the little Bible magnets on my refrigerator door. And a welcome mat to bless you before you walk across my floor. I got a Jesus bumper sticker and the outline of a fish stuck on my car. And even though this stuff's all well and good, I cannot help but ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about grace? What about forgiveness? What about a life that's showing I'm undergoing the change? Then he goes on and says, Well, I've got this way of thinking that comes so naturally, where I believe the whole world is revolving around me. Does that sound familiar? And I got this way of living that I have to die to every single day. Because if God's Spirit lives inside of me, I'm going to live life differently. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus wants to clean us up. And if we really want to follow him, it's going to involve some change. Some things will have to go. And some things will need to be added in. Hebrews 12.1 says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And you know, there are things in the Bible that are very explicitly dealt with that are called sin. But there are some things that aren't mentioned in the Bible that could still be a hindrance in our life. And we need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit on those things. It might not be in black and white in the Bible, but is the Holy Spirit saying, you know, it's not in black and white, but that's a hindrance for you. And the Bible says, throw those things out if it's a hindrance. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says that since we have these great promises, you know, eternal life and all the good stuff that God has promised... Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Get rid of the contaminants in our life. And, and I was struck by this, especially this week. I'm not sure I've really noticed this before, but it says everything that contaminates body and spirit. Now, I have preached for many years, and I focused on we need to get our hearts cleaned up. We need to get our minds cleaned up. But here it even mentions the body. And I, I don't know that I've ever really focused on that before. You know, the Bible is very explicit and open about the things that you think. And some of the things you do and some of the things you say need to be changed. But there are some perhaps habits in our bodies that need to be changed. And I'm not sure the Bible is real explicit on all of these, but again, we need to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Are, are we contaminating our bodies? That doesn't sound as spiritual as contaminating our spirits. But contaminating our bodies, it's mentioned right here in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 7, one. Now, I got an idea that that might even be different for every individual person. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you, perhaps, about something that's not best for you? Would you like a few examples? Are you ready? Here it comes. The Bible does not say anything at all about smoking. It doesn't. So I cannot declare that that is a sin. 
but if the Holy Spirit is convicting you about smoking, you better pay attention. Okay? The Bible also only addresses drinking in, in excess. If you get drunk, that's a sin. But if the Holy Spirit is convicting you about how you're drinking and how much you're drinking, you better pay attention to that. Okay? A little closer to home for this guy. Eating habits. The Bible doesn't give a whole lot of guidelines, particularly in the New Testament, about how you're supposed to eat. But there is such a thing as eating too much. Maybe the Holy Spirit might even convict you about some of the things you eat really aren't best for you. They might be fine for somebody else, but they're not best for you. Pay attention to the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm going to say. I don't. I am not, trust me, hopefully you get the drift that I, I don't want to be legalistic and kind of pick on every little thing. But I'm just pointing out a few things that perhaps the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you about. And if he is, pay attention to what he's saying. We good? Okay. All right. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. It says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We really want to be a follower of Christ. There's going to be some changes. Some things have to go. Some things need to be added in. So put off the old, put on the new. And let me tell you, folks, this is not just about trying harder to be a good person. I cannot be clear enough about this. I personally struggle with this from time to time. When the Holy Spirit brings conviction in my life, sometimes I just try harder. You know what happens usually? I fail, exactly, because my efforts don't succeed. What I really need is more of God in me because He always wins. And so me trying harder is not the key. The key is to get more of God in me. And then He helps me put off the old and put on the new. And so I want to say this, read your Bible simply to know God more. Invite God into your life. In fact, Ephesians 5.26 speaks about washing with water through the Word. We're talking about Jesus wants to wash us. Well, one of the ways He washes us is through His Word. As we read the Word, as we get the Bible into our hearts and into our minds, He washes us. He cleans us up. Let me say this. There is supernatural power in the Word of God to change lives. There really is can transform your life if you just read the Bible and get to know God more it will change you Hebrews 4:12 makes it even more clear the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart not only does God wash us with His Word, but sometimes He takes His Word like a sword and He begins to carve away things that need to go. That's the supernatural power of the Word of God. You need to be reading your Bible. And don't just read it to mark time, but read it to really hear what God has to say and to understand who God is. To invite God into your life. Now, Jesus is talking about washing, and his washing also refers to forgiveness. He has forgiven us, so we also should forgive others. In John 13 here, verse 14 and 15, we see some more red letters. And Jesus says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Let me give you another Bible verse, Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive 
whatever grievances you may have against one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness. And there's that bear with each other thing. I know I've hit on that quite a few times, but you, you know what that really means. Put up with each other. And probably when I say that, immediately somebody comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Bible says, put up with each other. Okay. And then forgive each other. And the truth is, we all want forgiveness when we're on that end of the stick. When we've been wrong and we want to restore a relationship with somebody, we really want them to forgive us. There's a Spanish story of a father and son who had become estranged. The son ran away, and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. And finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. And the ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up. They were all looking for for forgiveness. And they wanted that love from their fathers. They wanted to be restored. We all long for forgiveness when we've been wrong. And we want to get things made right. We want that forgiveness. And so we ought to be quick to forgive as well, especially in light of the forgiveness we've received from God. His forgiveness took him all the way to the cross where he died so that our relationship could be right with him. So to forgive one another when we don't have to go all the way to the cross is a small thing compared to what he has done for us. And the scripture says, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. He went all the way to the cross to forgive you. How far will you go to forgive somebody else? Roy Smith says, The art of forgiving is a spiritual grace every Christian should develop. Because this is so difficult to put into practice, he offers the following suggestions. Now, here's some practical ways to work on forgiving somebody. Let me give you a few of them. Number one, begin by assuring yourself that compared to Christ's sufferings, You have not been seriously wronged at all. Okay? Think of the cross of Christ and what he suffered. And if somebody's offended you, it's nothing compared to that. Two, recall the many kind deeds that have been shown to you, perhaps even by the person who has now harmed you. Three, list the benefits you have received from the Lord. Four, thank him for blessing you with his love and forgiveness each day. Five, make an honest effort to pray for the one who has injured you. There you go. That's a step in the right direction. Six, go even further by looking for an opportunity to help that person. Oh, man. Seven, if the offense is especially hard to forget, try to erase the memory by thinking of gracious and generous thoughts. And eight, finally... Before you fall asleep at night, repeat slowly and thoughtfully the phrase from the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, God's forgiveness to us is linked to our forgiveness for each other. And the Lord has set us the example. He has forgiven. We ought also to forgive. And here where Jesus says he set the example of washing their feet, he's also talking about serving. He demonstrated the heart of a servant. Here he is, the king of all kings, the king of the universe, and he's doing the lowliest servant's job of washing feet. And I want to say, if the Lord is willing to serve, we should be too. He's always our example. Galatians 5.13 You, my brothers, were called to be free. Yeah, we love freedom. And especially here, tomorrow's July 4th, we think about freedom. Freedom. But, got 
to love it. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. That's how your freedom should be used, to serve each other. Philippians 2.4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Galatians 6, 9, and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. We should be serving. Jesus served. We should serve as well. And then the red letters in verse 17, Jesus says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Here's the point. Don't just learn about God. Do what he says. You know, the devil knows all about God. Whoop-de-do. If you know about God, are you doing what he says? That's the key. Somebody said one step forward in obedience is worth years of study about it. Dr. B.J. Miller once said, It is a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than it is to face the responsibilities of not doing it. And somebody else put an even finer point on it and said, The cost of obedience is nothing compared with the cost of disobedience. Is that pretty plain and simple? Now, we're in the Gospel of John, and he really hammers on this point of obedience in all of his writings. Let me just give you a list of verses. John 14, 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. John 14, 24. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. 2 John 6. This is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. Listen, this is love for God. To obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Do you see the connection? I mean, over and over and over again. And this is not all of them that are written in the scripture. You say you love God and yet you live like the devil? Then you're a liar. According to the scripture, if you really love him, you will obey him. It's pretty plain, isn't it? I mean, it's up on the screen and everything. It's in your Bibles. If you really love him, you will obey him. So don't say, I love the Lord and then live like the devil. You're really only fooling yourself. If you really love the Lord, you will do what He says. And I, and I like the way that last one ends. You know, this is love for God to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. And here's the truth. If you love the Lord and you desire to obey His commands, He gives you the power to do it. I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again. He does all of the heavy lifting. You just kind of have to go along. He does all the work. You just cooperate. But if you love the Lord, you will do what He commands. And so I say, follow Christ and be changed. Cooperate with God to become a new person. He wants to make something new out of you. Someone who loves the Lord 
and reads his word. Someone who forgives others because you yourself have been forgiven. Someone who serves because the Lord set us the example of being a servant. And someone who obeys the Lord wholeheartedly. Don't just say the words. Do what he says. And be the person that he wants you to be. That's the example Jesus has set for us. So I want to ask you this question, and don't answer out loud, but examine your own heart. Do you love the Lord? And, and here's, here's the litmus test. If you love the Lord, you'll do what He commands, which means forgiving, which means serving, which means following His leading. Those are all tied to loving the Lord. And so let me ask again, do you love the Lord? Hopefully the answer is yes, and you, you will tie it to those other things and follow his leading in all of your life. And not just this romanticized version of, yes, I love the Lord, but I really love the Lord. So I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to serve. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to just get to know him more because I really love him. That's what I want for you. And I believe if you will really walk that kind of a life, you will never regret it. It will be the best kind of life you could ever live. Worth it. All the way. Totally worth it. Can I get a witness? Yes. Would you please stand? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the example of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of all glory, who showed us how to serve one another, who showed us how to forgive each other. Help us, Lord, to always follow the example of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts to not just say we love you, but actually walk it out in our obedience to you. God, I admit that I don't always get it right. Sometimes I'm off track. Sometimes I'm flat out disobedient because I got a bad attitude. God, would you forgive me and show me mercy and help me to always be obedient to you? Lord, we could all say that prayer. We need your grace. Help us, Lord, to follow you every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God's blessings on you. Have a great day and a great holiday tomorrow.